Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, I'm Hélène Langevin. I'm the director of the OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine, which is jointly based at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. It's my great pleasure today to present our speakers, uh, Dr. Paolo Cassano, who uh, is assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and director of the photobiomodulation uh, at, the mass, uh, at MGH Depression and Clinical Research Program and also at MGH Center for Anxiety and Traumatic Stress Disorders. Quite a title there. Um, Dr. Cassano's research has focused on developing new treatments for major depressive disorders and better characterizing the response to treatment uh, by examining comorbid, co comorbid conditions and cultural factors as well as trauma. And we're also very pleased to have our, our discussant uh, here with us uh, today, Dr. Margaret Nazer, who is Research Professor of Neurology at Boston University uh, School of Medicine and Boston VA Medical Center. She has had uh, VA and NIH-funded research uh, for uh, over 40 years and uh, with emphasis on neuroanatomy of lesions, uh, local, uh, lesion localization on CT and MRI in stroke patients with aphasia. Uh, so, um, and so... Without further ado, our, I'm going to introduce Dr. Cassano. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the invitation uh, to speak at the Brigham uh, Osher Integrative uh, Center. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today and to present on uh, uh, photobiomodulation. Uh, so invisible light, uh, the question obviously, does it help? Uh, and uh, uh, what does it do uh, to our mood? So these are my uh, disclosures uh, of note. Uh, I have uh, uh, co-founded a company that works uh, in the space of uh, the light treatments. However, I uh, don't have any employment with this company. Uh, and uh, um, we can go right in. So in terms of introduction, so think uh, you're walking on a summer day and uh, you're feeling more sexual. Uh, is that the light? Uh, this picture was taken from the movie, uh, From Here to Eternity. I haven't seen the movie, but I kind of recognize the context. So um, we all know that, and we learn it in school, that uh, uh, plants absorb the light. And they, uh, through the chlorophyll, the chloroplast, uh, they derive energy from the light. We also learned in medical school that the sunlight over the skin leads to greater synthesis of vitamin D. As a matter of fact, in, in, in you know, not, long, not, not so much, uh, not so long ago, UVB lamps were used to uh, prevent rickets in children. And to this date, uh, actually these lamps, uh, UVB lamps, are sold uh, in the market. However, um, UV are not just uh, always good, and uh, we know that uh, uh, they can induce mutations. So they can uh, create uh, um, uh, nucleotide uh, dimers, uh, which then leads to a greater risk uh, of uh, mutations and skin cancer. We also have learned uh, in uh, psychiatry or other type of trainings uh, that uh, bright light therapy, full spectrum, can actually improve the mood. It can be used. Uh, for seasonal affective disorders, uh, and also for non-seasonal depression. Um, how it works? The light is uh, uh, basically uh, seen by the retina and leads to increased production of serotonin in the brain and uh, decreased uh, melatonin. And that turns into positive effects on mood, energy, and also uh, the biological clock. So um, when we look at the spectrum, uh, we're familiar with uh, the plants absorbing on the red and the blue light. Uh, we are familiar with the effect of the full spectrum and the bright light uh, on mood. Um, we also, um, oh, something is clicked to here, but anyway, uh, we are familiar with uh, uh, the effect of um, uh, ultraviolet uh, light uh, and the beneficial and negative effects uh, of this higher spectrum in terms of energy. And of course, here are the bad guys, the X-rays and gamma. Um, but what about, uh, uh, oh, here it is. Um, what about uh, the invisible and near-infrared uh, light? So right below, in terms of energy, below the visible, 
What can that do? Well, um, why don't we then uh, uh, take a peek and talk uh, with our uh, patient here that graciously came in. And uh, why don't you take a seat over here? And she can tell us uh, firsthand uh, what was her experience with uh, transcranial light. Uh, let me just give you a one-liner. Um, at the time, uh, she was uh, a 44-year-old woman, uh, professional, um, mother of two children, married, um, and um, had suffered for depression for uh, roughly uh, five months in, in that episode, was kind of tired uh, of uh, her current uh, antidepressant medications and kind of dissatisfied with that and decided to come in uh, uh, for a clinical research trial on uh, uh, photobiomodulation. Thank you so much uh, uh, for being here today. Um, it, it, it means a lot, and um, you know you are one of us. And uh, um, you know I bet that looking at the epidemiology, that uh, uh, many people in this room at some point of their life, whether in the past or in the future, might be uh, in your shoes. Um, I wanted you to know that uh, at any point in time, uh, uh, you know, if there are questions you don't feel comfortable answering, uh, just let me know, and uh, it's okay to to stop uh, any time. Okay. Um, you know, I guess the first question is, uh, how did you uh, realize that uh, you were depressed or that something wasn't right? Um, I had had depression in high school, um, and then in my 20s, so I had always tried to fend it off again, um, and it uh, but I kind of expected it to come at some point again. So I was familiar, yet it took actually several years to really admit to myself it's time to get treatment and help. Um, so it was actually probably three years of depression and then maybe the five months more acute. I felt um, uh, embarrassed, ashamed, guilty, all of these things that I would have this problem. And so I thought to myself, at least some, maybe something good can come out of this, which is why I contacted the research department. Now, talking about that, uh, I, I was also curious, uh, why a clinical research trial? Uh, I mean, we do this every day, but at the same time, uh, you know, you had access to the best care, no matter what. I didn't really feel like I had access to the care as a physician. I felt um, uh, embarrassed to reach out clinically. And I had done you know, clinical trials in medical school. And so I just sort of put it into that compartment. I see. Um, I was curious about your experience of the treatment or the transcranial photobiomodulation. Uh, what was it like for you, I don't know, the first session or, or any session? Yeah, um, well, I liked the idea of it because it was not a medication, and I was reluctant to take medications, thinking of side effects and, and just the idea of it. So um, I liked that this was not a pill. This was not chemical that, that I understood, and I hadn't read anything about how it would work. So, um, And I knew I might have the sham treatment or the real. So I approached it with an open mind and thinking, if, if I feel better, well, even if it's the sham, then I'll understand getting out away from my desk, walking across campus, and lying quietly in a dark room for 20 minutes was actually therapeutic too. Um, so the first uh, visit, you know, you're measured and it's it's very clinical and scientific. So I liked that because I'm scientific. I, the the two light um, devices were strapped to my head, so a little bit bizarre but funny. Um, and then I was left uh, in a dark room, comfortable, and uh, I just waited to see what would happen. And um, during those 15 minutes, uh, what first happened, which I actually don't think I've even had the opportunity to explain to you this part, was um, within the first few minutes, five minutes, I had this uh, really intense um, feeling of my grief and sorrow over my mother, which was one of my big triggers. And it was all came sort of flooding in, and, uh, and, and it was there. And then after 
few more minutes, it just sort of floated away. And I was just continued to lie there with my own thoughts. And, um, I, and so I wondered, is this the treatment or is it just that I'm sitting here quietly and the thoughts can come? Afterwards, um, with that first treatment, there, there was some side effect uh, that when I, I got up and walked out of the office, to walk back to my office, passing people on the, on the street, walking towards me, I had um, the idea, very vivid, the faces were very vivid, and it looked like people were really intently looking at me, which I knew they weren't, but it just looked, rather than the look away as you pass someone, it, they were looking at me. And then as I went further along, I went to buy something to eat because I was hungry, which I noticed. Um, uh, I recognized my sister's face on someone walking. And as she got closer, it looked like me. And I said, that's me. But I know that's not me. So it was a bit bizarre. Um, I decided I would go back one more time. And if that feeling came back, I, I would not continue. But it, it didn't, and it turned out to be very helpful. Um, it, after three to six weeks, all my you know, answers to the questions of, if, of all the various feelings and symptoms went from always to never. And I realized around six weeks, I, the depression had lifted. Now, you know, that's what I was heading as well. You mentioned it was helpful. What was helpful uh, for or with? Um, I, I could tell as those weeks went on between like week three and six, I think, um, both the um, emotional symptoms and physical symptoms. I had a lot of um, heaviness and pain in my arms and my limbs, so I had physical symptoms of depression too. And uh, from being constant, uh, that gradually disappeared. Um, I. Um, uh, I had it written down. <laughs> that was one. Oh, a sleeping better. My appetite came back. My motivation came back. Concentration came back. Um, I had been avoiding finishing my notes, which we all understand. And um, I realized that I was just doing my work. I was like, oh, I don't, I didn't even notice that whether I was putting this off or not. Um, and so it just was very natural movement towards being better. So you alluded to some possible side effects uh, right at the very first session. And then fortunately, uh, they kind of disappeared. They didn't recur to uh, the, the following sessions. Uh, then uh, you know, I, I recall that uh, once the study was done, you came to the clinic. Uh, um, you started doing the treatment on the uh, on one side. Actually, was the, the right side, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you were doing it roughly uh, twice a week treatment, mm -hmm. and that was for a fairly long stretch. When when things didn't work anymore, um, yeah. So um, you know, at the end of the study, then I was able to receive clinical care, and I purchased this device. And uh, so I, I was very motivated because I was excited about this at work. Um, and at first, I was able to find time to take that 20 minutes um, and, and do the treatment. Um, but then every now and then, I would miss one. I, or I would say, maybe I don't need this anymore. Same compliance issues, really. And, and I could feel that dip um, with it. So I tried to be more. Um, compliant, and uh, but I could tell. I could tell when I would miss or had triggers um, that I needed this for maintenance. And eventually, the depression came back. Uh, roughly after a year yep. from starting the treatment, uh, mm -hmm. so th that was a little scary, if I recall. Yeah, and and so even though I was trying to maintain, um, I I hadn't done therapy. I hadn't done. Um, CBT, which turned out to be very good, highly recommended. <laughs> I hadn't done those other parts of it. So I suppose this was like just taking a medi medication. It was a treatment without the rest of it. Um, and if you, it, it just didn't work for me after a while. Um, and so then I went to medication, CBT, all of these things. Right. And how would, did that go? And that, um, that took some time, of course, to, uh, 
to kick in, um, but that's really maintained me now. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else uh, you would like to share at this point? Anything else, um, or do you have any question for me? I would just like to share that I wholeheartedly support this treatment. It was. It was real. It was. It worked, and I think it just um, maybe it needs to be refined in terms of dose and timing and um, follow up, but um, and combined with all the usual, you know, therapy and things. But I, I think that it's a really valuable tool, and I think of it for my patients who have tried everything, um, even ECT and things like that, because I. I would put it in that kind of category, and yet it's something you can do at home, and it's not so invasive, and uh, it's a good treatment. Yeah, we don't know if it will work for people who are resistant to ECT, but mm -hmm. uh, thank you for being here. Okay. So um, we'll uh, move right on. I mean, as, you, as you've heard uh, from our patient, uh, there are many elements here that sound very familiar to our experience with our other treatments. Response to treatment, uh, um, relapse uh, uh, related to poor adherence, uh, some side effects, uh, and also maybe some uh, withdrawal symptoms, although we didn't quite uh, go into much details on that. So let's talk about what's behind this treatment and why did we come uh, to this treatment at all. Uh, you might be familiar with this picture. This is uh, um, an optogenetic mouse. So what happens is that uh, uh, with uh, genetic manipulation, you can insert um, photoacceptors uh, like rhodopsin, and then you can modulate with the light uh, the behavior of animals. Now, we didn't do any of that. Um, however, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that we didn't have to, and in a sense, uh, uh, nature provides. So we started uh, this presentation talking about the cells of the plants, and the, the plants, as a matter of fact, have a chloroplast, absorb the light through the chloroplast, and then uh, once the glucose is produced, the mitochondria transform it in readily available energy, ATP. But um, what happens is that, uh, as a matter of fact, the animal cells also absorb the light. And uh, what it was done now by the chloroplast is entirely done in the mitochondria of uh, uh, the animal cells as well. So the respiratory chain um, in the mitochondria has this photoacceptor, it's called cytochrome C oxidase, which also absorbs the light. And for what it matters, bacteria also absorbs the light. So it's a fairly universal phenomenon. And uh, um, so the light brings energy to the cell. Now, why is that important here? Well, look at this synapse here. And uh, tell me now, what's the elephant in the room here? These synapses are filled with mitochondria, both presynaptically and postsynaptically. We focus on the vesicles, but yet uh, the brain is highly dependent on energy for its function. Now, our group um, was actually thinking about depression in terms of a low brain energy disorder. And this is not just our group. Uh, however, interestingly, we, find out, we found out that um, when people were treated for their depression with augmentation um, to their antidepressants, the, the pool of readily available energy in the cells of their brain, the NTP, increased if they responded. And uh, uh, the storage of energy decreased. So there was a mobilization of energy which was associated with response. Instead, non-responders had no change. So we thought, well, we could use that. Well, there is an intervention that delivers more energy. There is a lack of energy in the brain. This could be a treatment. So we embarked in the, our first trial, a little one. We we're very excited that a company at the time was producing a device for neurological intervention. It was a laser potent device uh, for transcranial photobiomodulation. The name of the company was Phototera, and at the time was partially uh, supporting our study. However, uh, we were just at the beginning of the study 
uh, we enrolled few patients when the company bankrupted. And uh, we didn't know what to do next. Um, and uh, uh, we decided to analyze our data. We found that there was a trend with a decrease in depressive symptoms. That was all nice. Um, however, we kind of stuck. Um, and uh, we decided to change the name of our study and call it uh, elegantly Elite 2 this time. And uh, uh, the best we could find was uh, a wrinkle treatment uh, device uh, that was available for cosmetic reasons over the counter. Obviously, our, um, you know, our confidence on the treatment kind of plunged. Uh, but the good news is that also our placebo effect as clinician plunged, and that actually might have helped our study at the very end. No matter what, uh, we decided that we would embark in the study, and we ended up enrolling 21 subjects, and we just talked with one of the uh, patients that was enrolled in the study. This was a double-blind randomized parallel study with an LED device, as I was mentioning, no more laser, with twice-a-week sessions for, for eight weeks um, in terms of enrollment, uh, um, we, uh, we enrolled, randomized 21. They were fairly distributed across the two groups, uh, sham and uh, treatment. Uh, we had a little bit more of a uh, uh, dropout in the sham group. Uh, however, when it came to the actual completers uh, that we uh, had in the analysis, um, and these were the, the ones that we excluded in both groups, they were fairly even. Um, because some of the patients in the treatment group had actually started other treatment and then were censored because of that. So uh, you might wonder, obviously, if uh, the treatment was effective for just for our patient, was that a placebo effect over here, or was that a more generalized effect that we found in our cohort? These were the demographic of the group. Uh, interestingly, uh, despite the small group, uh, they were fairly similar uh, how you would expect, as a matter of fact, uh, given the randomization. Uh, but uh, the treatment group had uh, a slightly higher uh, number of prior episodes of depression. Well, here is the, the overall sample. Uh, we ran three analyses, and two out of the three analyses uh, showed a significant separation from uh, uh, the sham of the treatment. Here the treatment is in red. Here on the uh, left is the severity of depression, the higher the worse. And you can see that with a baseline carried forward analysis so there was a significant effect. There wasn't with a lapsed observation carry forward. Um, however, when you go in the completers, uh, again you find a, a significant effect of the treatment. If you look at this score here, which is roughly seven, it tells you that on average, on the Hamilton uh, depression score, the treated patients who completed were in remission. And this is pretty remarkable uh, for an antidepressant treatment. Obviously, a small sample. That's uh, one limitation of this study. In terms of side effects, uh, um, interestingly, um, the patients who were treated had headaches, sometimes strange tastes in the mouth, and normal sensations. You've heard some of that. Other patients reported the impression of seeing vivid colors right after the treatment. And uh, um, although it wasn't significant difference, uh, the, the, the rate of uh, side effects across the two groups, uh, the number uh, or percentage of subjects who experienced at least one side effect uh, was uh, trending to be higher in uh, uh, the treated. Of course, we felt sorry for our patient, but at the same time, we thought, well, maybe this is the treatment. If we see more side effects, maybe that tells us something as well. Okay, um, so something strange happened, though. Um, and, uh, you know, while we were focusing on depression, our patients kept talking about their sexual functioning. And we brought back the topic, and they brought back the topic to the sexual functioning. Um, this was the experience of our patient over here that felt uh, um, that her sexual functioning with improvement or depression was much improved. She equated to her adolescent. Uh, a 65-year-old man, divorced, retired man, was actually kicked out. Uh, he was joking about it by his girlfriend because he was becoming too much, too sexual. 
and uh, uh, a young man also notice uh, a double, uh, a doubling in his uh, sexual activity during the study. And we were thinking, well, what's going on here? Uh, this is just the opposite of what we would expect with an antidepressant treatment, or at least with medication. And so we decided to bring uh, back the question to the data. These were the people that were not treated uh, in terms of their sexual dysfunction. This is a score in terms of, uh, of sexual dysfunction that considers uh, anorgasmia, libido, uh, erection, lubrication. And uh, you see, pretty flat for these patients, the sham people. However, the treated had a remarkable decrease, and not just the people who told us, but the overall group, which was highly significant. Uh, we're, we're baffled, um, and this was totally new, obviously not replicated at this point. So this is not just the only strange thing or uh, unexpected uh, thing uh, that came out of the study. Now, uh, if you forgive me the digression, in this picture, these two children uh, share the same name, however, two different destiny. One of them has Down syndrome, one is my son, and one is my nephew. My son is over here, he has the lobster, he's lively, he's energetic. Uh, his uh, cousin is now doing uh, speech therapy for uh, Down syndrome and music therapy. So at the time when I was uh, doing this study, um, a colleague of mine, a Pier Romano uh, physician in Italy, in Cagliari, over here in Sardinia, um, was interested in our results. And uh, uh, both the same devices, by the way, um, you've seen it in the picture, but um, it's this little guy over here, and uh, um, decided to work with this patient uh, um, and uh, try it out uh, with this patient. So one day he called me and he told me, well, um, I have tried this patient, this device, uh, this treatment uh, in uh, uh, children with Down syndrome. And my first thought was like, well, you can't do that. Uh, um, we barely have some data in adults, in depression. Um, and um, so he told me, well, you know, the parents are asking for it, uh, and uh, there's no treatment for Down syndrome. Um, so we spend a lot of time about how to inform the parents and the family about all the unknowns of this treatment. Although this is available over the counter, the FDA considered this device uh, um, a non-significant risk. It's still an off-label use. So a few months later, I was sitting in a Dunkin' Donut. And I got uh, this email from, uh, from my colleague. It was uh, an 80-year-old girl with Down syndrome. And here at the bottom, you see um, the treatment that she had received uh, from baseline, four treatments in the first two weeks, and then uh, four more treatments in the subsequent weeks. So a, uh, a four-week cycle, and then uh, another cycle uh, later on. And, um, the, Dr. Amano asked uh, this child to draw his picture, or the picture of her doctor. This was the first. Then uh, uh, you see kind of off-centered, no nose. Um, then this was the second. The nose came up, uh, more center. Then the, the arms, then the hands, and the ears, then the fingers, then the chest. It's quite amazing. Um, you know, I knew um, that this was, um, you know, from a scientist's perspective, it didn't mean much. However, my eyes um, start filled up. I'm actually feeling emotional at this point as well. And um, it was like seeing a child coming out of his shell. This was another child, um, a 13-year-old, still uh, much improved drawing skills. What he's reporting to us, um, Dr. Manu, is that uh, these children uh, are, have improved motor activity, they have uh, improved speech, um, they have, and this is not just his observation, even parents, teachers, um, they have improved move, uh, uh, mood with uh, uh, better uh, movements, um, sorry, uh, less crying spells, uh, um, 
and uh, um, better regulation, less aggressiveness. So um, I'll uh, introduce uh, Dr. Nazer here that will also talk about uh, uh, the rationale uh, for uh, the study uh, and uh, uh, for this uh, case treatment. Thank you so much for being here. Um, yes, and uh, I have no conflicts of interest, so that's easy. Um, the, uh, in 2014, my office um, published a paper uh, in the Journal of Neurotrauma uh, reporting in 11 um, chronic traumatic brain injury cases that there was improvement um, in cognition following a series of red, near-infrared, light-emitting diodes applied to the head. And the uh, main focus of the study was cognition, but uh, we had 11 cases, um, and, and the five had moderate or severe depression, and the rest were uh, minimal or mild. It's interesting that um, what happens is with improving cognition, uh, we got improvement in executive function as well as in verbal learning. And I'll show you how these graphs are put together here. This is, for 11 cases, the mean score. This is uh, standard deviation units. Um, zero would be average score, so they're below zero. And this is all pretreatment. Then we treat. Monday, Wednesday, Friday for six weeks. Then we stop treatment. And then we start to test again. And this is the improvement in the scores at one week after the 18th treatment, one month, and two months. So these are all highly significant for executive function and verbal learning. This is verbal learning is you hear a list of 16 words. You hear the list five times. 20 minutes later, you have to try to remember what were those 16 words. And you can see they were really bad in the beginning, but they got better. And I think the brain starts to reorganize itself after it's been exposed to these near-infrared and red photons, and it just keeps going. It's very stable. Uh, for PTSD, there were four cases who had PTSD in the beginning, and they responded well also. Depression. Now, this is a different uh, curve uh, that you're seeing here with the depression cases. Yes, um, they had depression in the beginning, this mean is 19, and then we treated six weeks, the depression went down. But now we're not treating, and at one month later and two months, it's starting to come back up. Not as bad as it was in the beginning, but it's still there. So we would conclude that home treatments and more treatments are a good idea. Um, the other population that we're interested in studying right now is football players. So um, I'm going to show you a case here, 65-year-old, former football player, professional, uh, played middle linebacker, started playing football in Pop Warner at age 10. It's estimated he's had thousands of subconcussive hits. So at about age 60, 61, he started with cognitive decline for at least four years. Um, this is going to show you improvement in executive function. It's the same protocol. Pre-test, treat six weeks, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, get 18 treatments, test a week later, test a month later, and two months later. And what's happening with this case? He's going downhill at two months. That's different from what you saw with what I'll call the average TBI cases I showed you in the beginning, who were mostly car accidents out on Route 128. So it's a dangerous place. And um, they, but they all responded to treatment, so this is good. Um, so we had the same pattern here with verbal memory. It was good up to one month, and then two months it starts going down. Uh, PTSD, it went down, and then two months coming up. Beck depression, it went down really to zero. That's amazing. And then at two months later, coming up. He's probably got tau deposits uh, forming uh, in his brain, mostly probably in the nodes of the default mode network. Now, He's a smart guy. He got a PhD in sports medicine after the football career and taught in college until he couldn't anymore and then high school and then had to retire early. So he went out and bought this device. I have it up here. I can show it to you. It's very easy to wear. Um, it's about $1,700 online. I have no conflict of interest, nothing to do with the company. Uh, but it is designed to send near-infrared photons to the nodes of the default mode network. So that's mesial prefrontal cortex, high parietal precuneus, left and right angular gyrus, and 
uh, we use a, an intranasal diode that will target uh, the olfactory bulbs in orbitofrontal cortex area, and that has direct connections to the hippocampus. The default mode network is extremely important um, because uh, it has to function in a coordinated manner, and this midline here in particular has to downregulate itself so that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can come up and have good cognition and attention and focus. And if this default mode network gets dysregulated, meaning this parietal is not communicating with this um, prefrontal area, uh, there's very poor scores on uh, verbal memory, executive function, um, even PTSD. Uh, depression. These are all the uh, papers that uh, outline a dis uh, dysfunction in the default mode network. And within the world of brain imaging and PET, the uh, mesial prefrontal cortex here and high uh, parietal precuneus here are the most demanding cortical nodes in the brain uh, for glucose and energy. And that's why they're so vulnerable when you start to get uh, brain deposits, as in Alzheimer's disease, and all kinds of dysregulation following TBI. So that's a good network to treat. Uh, this is showing you now our results for the football player. Uh, you remember that uh, he was treated at home. Uh, it's a California verbal learning test. You'll hear 16 words and recall 20 minutes later. So when he was first treated, he was treated in the office with the LEDs, and I have uh, what those look like here also. You can see what those look like. They're very lightweight, easy, easy to put on. Um, held in place with a stocking cap. Then he went three months, no, or two months, no treatment, and started down at two months. Then he bought his own equipment, and he starts treating at home with the NeuroGamma device, and he goes all the way up to 100% recall on the 16 words, and they use different words at different testing times. Um, he had similar uh, uh, excellent results with executive function. Now, I want to say something about what's special about the diodes in the uh, neurogamma, because they're pulsed at 40 pulses per second. Why are we doing that? Because there was a study done at MIT with Alzheimer's disease mice, and they put the mouse in a little plastic <laughs> sort of container in a dark room and uh, showed light to the eyes of the mouse, 40 pulses per second. One hour a day, seven days, sacrifice the mouse, look for beta amyloid deposits. And they found a 60% reduction only in the visual cortex because the pulse light was sent through the eyes. And they found a 41% reduction in tau, visual cortex, only because that was what was targeted. It was not light emitting diodes, it was only through the eyes, so it followed the visual pathway. And what did that 40 hertz do? It activated the microglia, the phagocytosis effect of microglia. So the microglia went after the abnormal protein deposits, meaning beta amyloid and tau. And in the football player, the main uh, neuropathological marker at postmortem um, is tau, T-A-U. And so I'm guessing, but I have no proof for that, that not only did we re-regulate the default mode network by sending uh, near-infrared photons into those cortical nodes, just those four cortical nodes, and into the hippocampus um, in an indirect manner, uh, we may have been starting to remove tau for him too, but you'd have to get some pretty fancy PET imaging done for tau, T807, or something like that. It would be very expensive. I don't have any funding to do this right now anyway, so, um, but that would be a good project. So um, he improved his PTSD uh, when he started treating at home again because it had gotten pretty bad with uh, three months of no treatment. His wife was <laughs> threatening a divorce again. So then uh, now it's down again. And then the Beck depression inventory, the same story. So he responded very well. He's moved. He's in Los Angeles, and he's continuing to treat at home. As I said, I do a lot with brain imaging. So this is uh, resting state functional connectivity data. Uh, and if you look at box two, that's probably the easiest one. These are the correlation coefficients between regions of interest, cortical regions of interest, in the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And when you see uh, only blue colors, those are very low correlations. It's as if what I showed you in the beginning, the mesial prefrontal cortex is not really communicating with the high parietal precuneus region of interest. So this is what he looked like in the beginning. Then we treat this black line. We're treating Monday, Wednesday, Friday for six weeks in the office. Now, 
We're seeing a lot more higher correlation coefficients here at one week after the 18th treatment and at one month after the 18th treatment. And then he isn't treated, he goes home, and nothing good happens in three months, nothing happening. So now we're back to the blues again, <laughs> literally, and it's uh, much lower uh, correlation coefficients. Then he buys his own equipment, he starts to treat at home. And for some reason, I don't know exactly why, he gets all these nice higher correlation coefficients again once he's been using this neuro device. Maybe that's just the way the brain's going to organize and recover. Another population we study, um, this was in Canada, in Toronto, with uh, dementia patients. There are five chronic dementia patients. Um, those who you're familiar with, the mini mental state exam, these cases entered with scores of 10 to 24. So that's mild to moderate severe. And you can see these are um, change scores here. And what happens is after 12 weeks of treatment, it's highly significant increase in the mini mental state exam scores. But then, after the 12 weeks, they took the, all the equipment away and they plummet. So uh, these people with uh, progressive neurodegenerative disease um, actually have to keep doing treatments. They need treatments at home. And I think that that's a, a really good um, way to go for the future. And also, this is my last slide, uh, we work with aphasia patients. They have left hemisphere stroke and uh, language problems, and again, this is uh, what their correlation coefficients looked like for the left-sided uh, default mode network before they were treated. And this is a patient two months after the treatment, and you can see how much higher the correlations are there. So what you want to do is get the brain rewired and back together again so it can um, help to improve behavior. And it was a significant uh, improvement in the default mode network pre and post when we used a certain protocol that treated only the side of the stroke, only treat the side of the stroke, don't treat both sides, that'll be bad. And um, two midline nodes on the default mode network that I said are very important, mesial prefrontal cortex and high parietal. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so give this much. back to you. <clears throat> okay, I'll uh, go uh, right to the next, so just uh, a few other relevant scientific uh, elements of evidence. Here you have seen uh, uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Nazer how when you stop treatment within roughly four weeks, uh, symptoms tend to go back up. And also you've seen the importance of the effect in connectivity. I wanted just to mention how connectivity is also critical in antidepressants response. As a matter of fact, um, we have seen now that uh, when uh, uh, patients respond to antidepressants, um, the uh, medial prefrontal cortex uh, has higher connectivity with deeper structure, such as uh, the amygdala. So that's very relevant, and it's possible that uh, we're now boosting the energy metabolisms of the prefrontal cortex and stimulating, therefore, the function and the connectivity with deeper area, and therefore, potentially, uh, producing an antidepressant response. I just wanted to mention uh, uh, two groups uh, that have now looked not so much at what happens uh, four weeks or six weeks into the treatment, that's what uh, Dr. Nazer has presented to you, but what happens right at the moment of the treatment? What happens to the brain? Uh, this group in Texas uh, looked at uh, the effect on uh, blood flow, and uh, um, they, they use uh, FNIRS uh, technique, and uh, what they saw is it uh, within it is that within uh, minutes of treatment, uh, the oxyhemoglobin was increasing in uh, um, the prefrontal cortex, and the deoxy was decreasing. Um, also, they've seen that uh, therefore the differential was statistically increasing over time, which is an indicator of uh, improvement in blood flow. This was true also on the opposite hemisphere. Um, the same group uh, uh, has looked at the cytochrome C oxidase, uh, the photoacceptor, you remember, in the mitochondria and the respiratory chain, what we said that that's what we need and we have already without needing any uh, optogenetics. So what they saw is that um, the actual, um, within minutes, uh, the cytochrome C oxidase became more oxidized um, fairly rapidly within minutes, and that was significantly different from uh, sham treatment. That's an indicator that the respiratory chain is therefore active, more active. A different group uh, in Germany has looked at um, 
the excitability of the cortex or the motor cortex after treatment. And now they have shown that uh, with the treatment, uh, they were able to significantly modulate within minutes uh, the uh, excitability uh, through um, assessment of uh, uh, motor evoked potentials. Now back to the clinical case. So I guess the key message is that transcranial photobiomodulation with neon infrared light uh, is a potential new treatment uh, for uh, depression. Um, we still need uh, a lot of science and uh, we hope that more people will be interested in embarking in this journey. Um, we have a clinic at Mass General. Meanwhile, for people who are interested in this treatment, uh, FDA, non-FDA approved. Uh, and uh, uh, we're only treating people that are either not tolerating uh, existing evidence-based treatment or are resistant to those or are not wishing to receive those treatments. Um, this would have not happened without the help of all of them at the MGH Anxiety and Depression Program. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we can uh, uh, sit over here. Um, first of all, of all, I think it's very interesting uh, study in the clinical trials. I think that I have a question is about the, um, the wavelength. I think Dr. Nessel is using LED and Dr. Persano is using, I think, a different uh, spectrum. Do you have any idea? Any wave is fine, or you're gonna do some research? Sure. So um, there's a broad spectrum of uh, wavelengths that are potentially helpful. Um, so both the, the red light um, and then the near infrared light. Uh, the near infrared light uh, ranges in between 760 uh, to roughly 1040. Um, and uh, we know that the peak absorption of the cytochrome C oxidase is 810, um, but you could potentially use uh, a variety of different wavelengths, uh, um, and we don't know which one is the, the most helpful. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, there, yeah, we can give you references on that. They've done wonderful studies uh, with uh, cell cultures and so on. The red is also a great receptor um, for the uh, cytochrome C oxidase. It, the cells, in my opinion, as an acupuncturist, I wear two hats. I'm a PhD, and I have a licensed acupuncture. I still have my license. And um, 35 years later. And so the issue is that um, the, uh, the red and the near-infrared, you can use it. The cells love it. And in, in the world of acupuncture, because we want to use uh, the red wavelength for shallow acupuncture points on the hands, the feet, face, the ears, but we use near infrared, 810, 830, 870 for deep acupuncture points because the longer wavelength in the 800s is going to go deeper. And the shorter wavelength in the 600s, the red, is going to be more shallow. And there's a lot of stories you can talk about that. Why do the cells like the red? And Mike Hamlin from Mass General Hospital, who gave us a lot of <laughs> cellular hard science information about the effects of the wavelengths, thinks that the mitochondria <laughs> long ago with single cells on planet Earth uh, wanted to build up the um, sort of the energy for the cell at sunrise and at sunset, but mostly at sunrise. So hydrogen, helium is the sun, and uh, the, the best wavelength you can use is 632.8 nanometers, which is a helium neon laser. And that was discovered back in the 1960s in Hungary. So there's a lot of reasons why maybe the cells really like red light or near infrared. Does that answer your question? I did want to say light emitting diodes are non-coherent light. And that's why you can use them at home, because you can look right into them. And it's no problem. You're not going to damage. And you're not going to burn the retina. If you're using lasers, high power lasers, you don't want to look into it, and it's more, it's more uh, it would not be a good idea. So the LEDs are a great advance. This technology keeps changing. It, it's really uh, still emerging. And I mean, it's really hard to keep up with it, to be honest with you. There's always a new device. So, uh, Dr. Naser, you mentioned that in the experiments in, uh, at MIT with the Alzheimer model mice, mm -hmm. um, that the changes in beta amyloid and in tau were observed in visual cortex? Yes, that's correct. Um, 
but the direct input from the retina is to the lateral nucleus in the thalamus. So yeah. how does one account for that uh, change into the second order neurons? Well, I agree with you. That is a very good question. I mean, it goes from the thalamus, but then that lateral geniculate body has connections uh, also back up to the visual cortex. And it's published in Nature 2016, and it's a really long paper, and I'm sure you, you can read it, and um, maybe you get more information from that. I can give you the reference. But the point is that you don't have to have direct stimulation of that area. You can, you can stimulate an area that then has a secondary connection. Right. Oh, yes, definitely. Um, and it's visual cortex only, and it didn't go anyplace else. So, I mean, it didn't go to um, medial geniculate body and the auditory cortex or anything like that. It was strictly the visual pathway that it uh, followed. And that's what I think is happening with our neuro device here when we're treating the, um, the, the cortical node areas of the default mode network that it's going right there, and that's the most important network in the brain. It's called the default mode because, by default, it's the most important one, and it's the one that's the most greedy for energy. And you can read papers on that and give you references. It's, it's an amazing. I think this is wonderful. The other thing I want to send you home with is the idea of this new lymphatics drainage system for the brain. Um, they only discovered it. Uh, maybe two, three years ago, 2015, uh, LUVO, L-O-U-V-E-A-U, and Nadergaard, N-E-D-E-R-G-A-A-R-D. For years, always, they thought, the brain doesn't have a lymphatic system. How does it get rid of its waste products? Nobody, uh, I don't know. So three years ago, they finally found these really tiny, tiny lymphatic vessels that are basically in the dura. <clears throat> and they're like a millimeter diameter. And if they get damaged or clogged, the brain can't... Uh, rid itself of the waste products. I mean, every day you build up beta amyloid with your cognitive functions. When you go to sleep at night, that goes away. But if you've got TBI, PTSD, all kinds of trauma to your brain, and all kinds of other abnormal protein buildup, beta amyloid and tau, a lot of times you don't sleep well, and you can't drain the brain of its waste products. And Alzheimer's disease patients, you talk to them, they'll tell you they can't sleep. And the one thing that the caregivers loved about the study in Toronto with the five chronic dementia patients, the caregivers said, oh, now I can sleep because my partner is sleeping and less wandering and less emotional outbursts, probably because we vasodilated that lymphatic system. We know we vasodilate um, the arterial and venous, venous flow in the brain, too, because we have a lot of brain imaging on that. And so you're just helping the brain to get rid of these waste products, I think, as part of it. And they're, the main drainage system is in the mid-sagittal sinus area. So this midline area is critical. It's very, very important. Question. I have a technical question, Dr. Cassano. How was sham irradiation actually done in the study? Because near infrared might warm up the skin, so the patient actually might feel it. So how, how was it done actually? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing uh, that I haven't mentioned is that uh, um, the company who manufactured those devices, the skin uh, wrinkle treatment devices, uh, Photomedics, actually kindly supported us with the devices, and they produced for us uh, a sham treatment. So the sham treatment was uh, virtually identical to the real treatment. You know that uh, a near infrared light is invisible. Uh, however, on top of that, we had the yellow LEDs that showed that the device was on, the fan was going on, so the, the sound was there, and there also was uh, warming that was produced by resistors that were introduced uh, when the device was powered on. So warming of the skin as well, or just of the device? Um, warming of the skin, yes, absolutely. And that's related to the functioning of the device, typically related to the light that you're shedding that will somewhat uh, warm up the skin because most of the light actually is absorbed by the skin. Only 2 or 3% of the light that you're shedding actually penetrates to the brain. Um, and uh, uh, so you're totally right that uh, we needed a, a sham device that produced significant warming equivalent to the treatment, uh, even when the light was not absorbed. And that's what the company gave to us. Thank you. I would like to mention that at the VA hospital, I have helmets. 
And Jeff Knight is here, and he has helmets, too. He works at the VA with PTSD patients. And um, they had to engineer the fan system in the helmets because they're really something to see. And, you know, there's five down the midline because we want to get default mode network and left five on the left side, five on the right side. And um, it's really uh, impressive to see. But the engineers can do it to make it feel the same. And I've tried. We have two different types of helmets, and um, you can't tell real from sham. And for one more question. Thank you. This is um, fascinating. Uh, there's been a lot of attention recently to mitochondria and mitochondrial energy production. And I think, I don't know if you're familiar with um, the functional medicine community, but they've um, sh been doing a lot of work in this area. And um, just thinking more broadly about disorders in which mitochondria are perhaps functioning less well, where there may be um, genetic uh, inborn mutations in mitochondrial energy pathways, um, or potentially even conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome. Is any thoughts about this technology in those areas? Yeah, so to my knowledge, uh, uh, it hasn't been tried in the, uh, patients with mitochondrial disease. Uh, I don't know if Marnie has um, heard I don't really have experience with that um, either. I've had people ask me about it, and it's a good question. Um, however, that's a really tough one, though, I think. You're dealing with something special there. It's a little different from all this other indirect. However, one thing that I believe is interesting is that uh, in the mitochondrial disease, for instance, when the respiratory chain is affected, uh, you could have uh, a disease that affects complex one, complex two, different targets potentially in the respiratory chain. And then obviously the end results is the energy deficiency. Um, what is interesting is that with uh, different types of light, uh, you can actually intervene at different sites of the respiratory chain. So at least from a theoretical standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you could bypass um, the, the limiting uh, step and deliver energy um, after kind of the, the, the impairment down, downstream. And so it could be a very promising treatment. We just haven't tried. I should say also that, um, you know, in the electron transport chain, it starts with NADH, and then it goes through these complexes, um, coenzyme Q10, and then it finally gets the last complex, which is cytochrome C oxidase. Well, the cytochrome C oxidase is a, a photoacceptor for red and near-infrared wavelengths, but NADH is a photoacceptor for blue. And um, so there's just a lot to talk about that we don't have time for, <laughs> uh, but there are other ways around it, possibly. Also, I should say that the near infrared, no, the, um, the blue wavelengths, um, they're getting close to uh, violet, and um, they can have an antibacterial effect. And there's a lot of research going on right now with um, 405 nanometers and uh, some of the blue wavelengths to treat MRSA and MRSA methicillin resistance. Staphylococcus is really a problem, and um, I think that the uh, wavelengths of light, especially in the blue, can be helpful that in the future. So um, thank you so much uh, to our presenters and also uh, thank you very much to our patient for coming and sharing her experience with us.